Thank you for coming along this afternoon. Um, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce um, Dr. Suzanne Belton. I'd like to um, uh, recognise that we're meeting on Larrakia lands, and I'd like to pay respects to the traditional elders, past, present, and future. Susan's got a very interesting uh, background. Uh, I mean, we've read clinical experience, community health, women's health, family planning, refuge health, and alternative birth systems. Um, Susan's worked in Southeast Asia and China, and research interests in the sociology and anthropology of health, social and cultural context of reproductive health, gender and violence against women. Um, and we're very pleased to have uh, Susan today present on women's reproductive health, abortion in rural, regional and remote areas. areas. Thank you, ma'am. It's all yours. Thank you. I'll leave you in peace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you very much for coming. Um, I also would like to uh, pay my respects to the traditional elders, the Larrakia people, and thank them for allowing me to do this work on their land. So um, I'm just going to start off, but I'm just going to take you on a bit of a discursive journey through these areas um, on termination of pregnancy, the policy and politics of termination of pregnancy. I'm going to show you some um, Northern Territory, some national and international data, comparative data, and generally talk about um, human, the links between human rights and law and some of the clinical practice, and talking about some um, research that I've already begun in the Northern Territory. So, let me begin. Australia has a first world health system with very low rates of maternal death and disability. Contraception is widely available and used. However, over half of pregnancies are unplanned and abortion is relatively common, with about a quarter of the women experiencing an elective abortion. Each year there are an estimated 85,000 abortions for a population of about 23 million people, or put another way, an abortion rate of 19 per thousand women. The 1970s saw significant new legal rulings that enabled safe hygienic abortion and the provision of universal health insurance or Medicare for the cost of the abortion. There is a momentum to move abortion from criminal to health law in Australia. However, Australian women's access to early medical abortion with methoprestone or indeed other forms of termination of pregnancy have been hindered by archaic laws, bureaucratic hurdles and patriarchal conservatism and is yet to be fully realised. Gender discrimination thwarts women's reproductive health. I'm going to talk about the first thing around risk because a lot of the public discourse revolves around risk and how dangerous termination of pregnancy is. The relationship between access to lawful and safe abortion services and maternal survival is undisputed. Lawful termination of pregnancy eliminated morbidity and mortality associated with provision of clandestine services. A woman's death in pregnancy is now very uncommon, and death in early pregnancy is rare, and death due to termination of pregnancy, extremely rare. The death rate following abortion in Australia is so low that it is not possible to even quantify it. In Australia, the dangers of pregnancy and delivery outstrip the risks of abortion by at least an order of magnitude. Each year in Australia, around 10 women die during pregnancy or childbirth, and this is considered to be very low risk, and Australian women are rarely cautioned against fecundity. Indigenous women and those living in remote areas are most at risk during pregnancy or childbirth, while numerous health problems like suicide and domestic violence also cause considerable maternal mortality. In Australia, between the years 2006 and 2010, 15 women died in early pregnancy, so I'm talking about the first three months of pregnancy, from various causes. One woman died from a termination of pregnancy, and by way of comparison, three women died in that same time period from natural ectopic pregnancies. Many more women died from childbirth than those undergoing any kind of termination either in Australia or globally. Other common life events are not exactly comparable. However, an appreciation of the level of risk can be gained from contrasting the mortality risk from other activities with the mortality risk of abortion in large published series of studies on women's contraceptive and fertility type experiences. 
observational cohort data collected from very large population groups from developed nations where the burden of illness is similar to that of in the population of Australia of women may be used for less exact comparisons. So for example, a very large cohort study of women using the combined oral contraceptive pill in Germany demonstrated that a woman's risk of death was three in 100,000 years of use. While an analysis of risks in the United States has indicated that the risk of death from early medical abortion is equivalent to the risk of death incurred during a marathon run, this suggests a similar risk of death arising from taking the oral contraceptive pill, running a marathon, or having a termination of pregnancy. But more than survival, reproductive autonomy is fundamental to women's dignity, ability to participate in society, ability to voluntarily choose motherhood, and a basic human right. Reproductive autonomy encompasses notions of information and knowledge of sexuality and reproduction, access to services including family planning and termination of pregnancy, and autonomy in body or bodily integrity and consent. And this stems from a liberal tradition of liberty and freedoms that were taken up in feminism. Barriers to getting an abortion. So this um, slide encompasses a lot of information and I'll go and talk about more of these things in this, as this talk goes on. However, there are many barriers to reproductive autonomy for women. The perceived naturalness and inevitability of motherhood is difficult to challenge and it's an unconscious bias in our society. Poverty causes requests for, for top or termination of pregnancy, but also limits access to services which are largely privatised in Australia. Um, and the, there is, uh, uh, these are above the costs of the Medicare rebate, that's what I'm talking about now. There are no studies in Australia of the out-of-pocket costs, such as days off work, travel to services, childcare minding for, for the women that they have to pay when they're arranging their termination of pregnancy. Doran and Nankarov's systematic review in 2016 found that finding a health provider can be very difficult, that appropriate training of all types of health providers was not adequate, that there were often people who had moral oppositions, that um, caused barriers for, for health services and women, and appointments availability was lacking, and that referral mechanisms were also poor within the health system. There was a lack of services, gestational limits, there was harassments of patients and staff, and these were all found to be significant barriers in many developed countries, not just Australia. And Doran and Hornibrook's work with women in rural New South Wales demonstrated similarly that women had difficulty in accessing reproductive health services. Unwanted, mistimed or unfortunate pregnancies, and by that term unfortunate, I mean those pregnancies that are wanted but still are terminated for various reasons, have existed forever. Termination of pregnancy is one of the most common gynecological encounters yet it is often silenced and ignored. Social relationships, cultural constructs, mediate abortion stigma and deviance. And in 1963, Goffman's work on stigma um, led the, the way for us to think about this in health. And, and I'm thinking of diseases in particular, things like leprosy, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS. Um, there's Ill illnesses which are still stigmatized even today. Lincoln Freeland's work from 2001 explains the construction of stigma. So in the first component, people distinguish and label human differences. In the second dominant cultural beliefs, link labeled persons to undesirable characteristics, to negative stereotypes, and in the third, labeled persons are placed in distinct categories so as to accomplish some degree of separation, the us and the them. And in the fourth, label persons experience a status loss and discrimination which lead to unequal outcomes. And I think this applies to abortion stigma. So once the, this is according now to Kumar, it's a direct quote, once the exceptionality of abortion is rhetorically established, it is possible to create a category of those women who abort as deviant from the norm. So the label of selfish women 
arises despite the fact that we know that half of women who terminate pregnancies are already selfless mothers. Kumar goes on to state that in the Netherlands, Norway and other Scandinavian countries where abortion is less legally restricted, public attempts to control pregnant women's access through guilt or shame are cast as deviant, patronising or very inappropriate. And I wanted to just say that abortion is really not a fixed category. Um, it, it changes over time and it's location specific. So historically and culturally, abortion has taken on different meanings. Um, and an example of this is Whitaker's work from Thailand, where Buddhism actually rejects abortion. Yet in her work with Thai Buddhist villagers, they used a process of situational ethics, which it enabled them to make reproductive health decisions that included abortion. And I think similarly, many Catholic women do this today as well. Let's talk about policies and politics. So according to Pacheski, the power dynamics that underlie abortion are part of an ideological struggle about the meaning of family, motherhood, and sexuality. And yesterday, in Poland, millions of women um, went on strike for their reproductive health rights for legal access to termination of pregnancy. Poland is an advanced democratic country with a well-educated population that is not facing any external threats of war or genocide that may trigger nationalistic pro-natal policies. But they had wanted to introduce new legislation to ban all access to termination of pregnancy. Poland already has the most restrictive abortion laws in Europe, um, with only um, clauses allowing for rape, incest, and an imminent maternal death to allow for a woman to have a termination of pregnancy. Um, the stigma or silencing and shaming of women or their supporters was not able to halt the mass protests and the refusal of women to go to work in Poland. In Australia, there is no party political view of abortion other than that of the Greens Party, which specifically supports access to termination of pregnancy. Um, this is a kind of report card uh, that was uh, put out by the Peak Advocacy NGO, Australian Women's Health Network, prior to the last federal, or the federal election this year. So it, it disseminated this scorecard and it talked about gender in policy, whole of government approach, with the associated funding that would be needed for, to, for implementing it. And you can see these results yourself. Um, it was an integrated approach. Um, an idealistic and aspirational approach that would assist the government to make better use of scarce resources by delivering timely and streamlined services to women and their families while delivering cost benefits to the whole of us. It talked about government funded independent women's peak, uh, women's peak body um, to work on new national policies and to be like a think tank on policy and research. It called for the establishment of women's advisory committees and diversity units in all federal government departments. It wanted to implement a new approach to creating a healthy society. And this, um, what they suggested was that it would, should report back directly to the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Um, it called, called on funded national, a funded national conversation of sustainable and ongoing funding. And it actually echoes, um, in some ways, the 1989 women's health policy, and I'll talk about that now. But since the second wave of feminism, I think there's been a diluting of calls for abortion um, and action in that area in Australia. So I'm now going to talk about the 1989 national women's health policy. This was a watershed moment in women's health in Australia. And I think there was possibly only one other country that I'm aware of, Canada, had a, a, a women's health policy at this time. So in the 1980s, there was a lab, some Labour governments, and this is particularly an outcome of the Hawke Labour government. In 1989, a number of key influences worked together to facilitate policy development. The activities of women working in a number of arenas coincided with the election of relatively supportive governments. The creation of women's policy machinery and bureaucracies employment of feminists in key positions, and opportunities for policy expansion that was afforded by federalism. Um, 
These influences within the Australian ideological context of strong support for social liberalism account for the country's distinctive policy position. So the 1989 document, it talks in really plain language about goals, principles, women's health issues, and areas for action, and how you actually monitor that. Um, and it's really an entirely beast to the national policy that we see now, which is much more watered down. This is the 1989 policy. It talks about reproductive health sexuality quite explicitly. It says, reproductive health issues concern all women, include the management of menstruation, fertility control, abortion, pregnancy and childbirth, breastfeeding, sexually transmitted diseases, menopause, infertility, and diseases of the reproductive organs. So quite broad and not isolating any one thing in particular. The safety and effectiveness of contraceptive methods, the availability of information about sexuality and reproduction are matters which require action as they are of great concern to women. Sexual and reproductive health care often involves the provision of assistance to women in making and implementing important life decisions about their relationships and family formation. And the health system must recognise this partnership between women and health professionals in this area where social concerns as well as medical expertise are critical factors in appropriate care. It's really an amazing document and I think it still stands the test of time. And this was produced during, as I said, the Hawke government with a special women's advisor, Ms. Lisa Newby, back in the day. But the current National Women's Health Policy, it mentions sexual and reproductive health care. It actually funds family planning organisations today. And it mentions things, it then goes down into the minutiae of very specific things. It, calls, it talks about FGM, assisted reproductive technologies, polycystic ovarian syndrome, perinatal depression, on and on and on, this kind of menu of all of the kind of things in women's health. Um, and top is very top, or termination of pregnancy, is very vaguely mentioned, but really it merits no further discussion in this national document. So I looked at the Northern Territory policy, the 2015 to 2020, so it's our current policy in the Northern Territory. And it focuses on arguably important issues in, in women's, in, for women in the Northern Territory. It focuses on women's safety and it talks about domestic violence. Um, it doesn't make the link particularly about the connection between domestic violence and, and reproductive autonomy, which it should. Um, it talks about women's health and well-being, it talks about economic security and leadership and participation. And Surprisingly, in the Northern Territory, we have very strong participation by women in um, politics, in Parliament, and as senior managers. This is the direct quotes again from page 11. It highlights the significance of gender as a key determinant of women's health. It acknowledges that women's health needs differ according to the life stage they might be in. It prioritises the needs of women with the highest risk and the poorest of health. It ensures the health system is, wants to ensure that the health system is responsive to all women um, and talks about health, uh, illness prevention and health promotion. It supports effective and collaborative research, data collecting and monitoring and the transfer of knowledge to advance that evidence base in women's health. And I'm going to go on to talk about how this actually isn't occurring in practice. Hopefully it will in the period that is um, coming up. Um, and it also notes difficulties with culturally appropriate health care and also some of the geographical limitations that we have in the Northern Territory. But I find the crux of it when I read it, the tone is about women taking responsibility for themselves, about taking responsibility for their own health. It takes a bit of a high moral ground, if you will. It talks about levels of smoking, drinking. In fact, women in the Northern Territory are just simply not playing enough sport. It's a little finger-wagging, indeed, when you read it. Women are endorsed to make healthy life choices on page 12, which places the responsibility ideologically on the individual. There is no mention of human rights, despite Australia being castigated by the United Nations on this very issue. Australia is a signatory to several human rights instruments that support men and women's reproductive health rights. The Commission on the, the Commission on the sorry the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women being probably 
the most relevant. But others have been, uh, there's many others as well that I want to say. There, there's a whole body of human rights, and I won't list them all off, but the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, the International Covenant of Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, and the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel and Inhumane or Degrading Treatment are often used um, to argue a position for women's access to termination of pregnancy. Um, and these are all lacking in any of the policies that you look at in um, Australia. Now, I want to talk a little bit about playing um, po the politics of women's health, staying on, moving a decade forward now into 1996. In 1996, a Conservative Howard government legislated with the effect of banning the importation of mifepristone into Australia. Now, mifepristone, for those of you, there's two, some people in the room who may not be aware of that, but mifepristone is a, um, it's a new technology, a new way of doing termination of pregnancy by using tablets. When I say new, in Europe it was um, discovered in 1988, so it's been around for several decades. It's new to Australia. It took another decade before a group of single-minded female members of parliament raised a successful bill to allow the Therapeutic Goods Administration, or the TGA, and this is a body that regulates all medicines um, in Australia, to manage the medication in 2006. The TGA is part of the Australian Government Department of Health, and it is the institution which has the authority to scientifically access and monitor all medicines used in Australia. The Minister of Health from 2003 to 2007 was Tony Abbott. He was well known for his opposition to abortion and his socially conservative views. And I'm quoting here from Miller, 2015. Mifepristone was not imported by pharmaceutical companies during his tenure. The Minister of Health agitated on the issue of abortion, triggering developments which unintentionally led to law reform and to the importation of mifepristone into Australia. In 2004, during a public speech, Minister Abbott pondered the issue of being a Christian politician and he stated, the problem with contemporary Australian practice of abortion is that an objectively grave matter has been reduced to a question of the mother's convenience. Abortion is the easy way out. The Minister's comments led to a number of responses. It influenced other conservative politicians to raise their concerns about abortion rates and the availability of publicly funded abortions. But not to be silenced, Lynn Allison, former Australian Democrats, Judith Troth from the Liberal Party, Fiona Nash from the National Party, and Claire Moore from the Australian Labor Party, introduced a private members bill in 2005 to remove the approval process of Mifepristone from the Conservative Minister of Health. Titled the Therapeutics Good Goods Amendment Bill 2005, the bill returned to the TGA the responsibility of assessing the safety, efficacy of mifepristone and effectively reversed the ministerial veto that had been put in place since 1996. In February 2006, the bill was passed by a majority of nearly two to one in both Houses of Parliament. It is noteworthy that the vote was gendered, and 90% of women senators voted for it, compared with only 46% of male senators. The issue at hand was the Ministers of Health's intrusive role in deciding the safety and efficacy of pharmaceuticals, something that he possibly was not an expert in. However, it became a proxy abortion debate. The ironic dimension of the federal debate on the TGA approval is highlighted by Aubrey, who points out that, the, that Minister Abbott, and this is a quote from Aubrey, 2007, he began the debate by seeking to arouse a sense of shame about the Australian abortion rate in Australia, at least in part to encourage a demand for some form of tightening of abortion law or abortion funding. Instead, the abortion debate that he helped to incite ended with a decisive conscious vote in in, in favour of the private member's bill that removed the authority to approve any consideration of the abortifacient drug, drug RU486 from the Minister of Health. 
and return it to the TGA. So the Minister of Health was on the losing side. Now, there's something that kind of, if you like, was a little bit ironical that's happened. So Tony Abbott has been no friend to women's health in Australia. And in his honour, there's been a um, telehealth service that has been released in Australia. And it's called the Tablet Foundation after Tony Abbott. I think it's um, named in Tony Abbott's honour, although he, he probably wouldn't appreciate the honour. And uh, this is run by a senior gynaecologist practitioner and he has now provided over a thousand early medical terminations of pregnancy all over Australia. Um, and it, the cost, it's a, it's a not-for-profit organisation and the, um, the cost of an abortion is 250 so it's a, it's a very low cost, one of the low, most low cost abortions that you can um, get in, in Australia. So, I know when I give these talks, I sometimes wonder what Australians think. I mean, clearly the Parliament um, in 2005, 2006, was not in favour of restricting um, women's access to termination of pregnancy in any way. And there's some, been some fairly decent research done in Australia of Australian um, the Australian public's opinion going from 1979 to um, about 2013. And you can see here um, that very clearly there's a very small minority of people, um, this is the grey line, who disagree with abortion on any account, that think in fact it should be banned. Um, and, but there's a much larger and in fact increasing majority of people who say that abortion should be readily obtainable. And I think that's important to bear in mind whenever you have um, discussions about this uh, in Australia. So I'm going to move on to talking about some of the uh, laws that regulate access to termination of pregnancy in Australia. And uh, it's an interesting area. Australia is a, a federation and uh, abortion, there are many, many abortion laws in Australia. There isn't one overarching abortion law. Every jurisdiction has its own particular law. And this is a very quick infographic that, that um, outlines some of the differences. You can see that the deep uh, green colour are those jurisdictions where there's been the most recent reform in Australia and the um, lime green is less reformed and the grey, um, you'd have to say, it was archaic, essentially, archaic law. The laws in Australia came in during the colonial era in Australia. We were colonised by the British and that's where our um, early laws came from. And in the early days, of course, abortion was, all forms of abortion were illegal and what we saw was the clandestine uh, provision with the associated mortality and morbidity for women and underground services that were provided by um, people in the neighbourhood up to senior specialists would be, be providing all for a fee, all for a fee. So this mishmash of laws makes it very difficult for health providers that a lot of our health providers work in different areas they move from state to state. Um, and one of the things that we found in the Northern Territory that triggered some of the questions that we were asking about the laws, when practitioners came to the Northern Territory and had practiced in different states and could practice differently, they asked, why can't I actually provide up-to-date reproductive health care like I do in other states? Um, and why is it different here? Your law is very restrictive. There is a gradual movement in liberalising abortion laws in Australia. So, the, the, and that is, is, you can see that is progressively happening. The next states that are due for reform will be the Northern Territory. This is in progress at the moment. South Australia is starting to reform, and Queensland has also started to reform. So, I, I, I think that's a, a, a good thing. I, I think the some of the questions that we we should be asking ourselves in Australia is why do we even need law? There, there are 
Canada is a, is a fabulous example where what they've said is it's actually, it's actually discriminatory to have a law that regulates women's access to abortion. You can provide safe abortions to women by simply having good quality practice and um, women's normal medical consent that they would give in any other type of um, process. So um, this stuff is, is archaic stuff. It's left over from an era when abortions were criminalised, they were underground, and I really um, often fail to see the benefit of them for health practitioners or women. Some of the newer reform states have got some very interesting clauses and they include what is called bubble legislation or protection zone legislation and that's in um, Victoria and Tasmania that put, um, if you like, legal zones of protection around particularly clinics where terminations may be occurring that prevent patients from being harassed by people who feel that they need to um, share their moral viewpoint um, at that time with patients. They, it's actually an intrusion on patients' uh, safety and privacy during that time. So the bubble zone legislation is interesting. The conscientious objection clause in Victoria is an interesting one that we could see, consider in the Northern Territory. And that is simply um, suggests that someone who ha holds a, a, a moral objection or a conscientious objection to termination of pregnancy must simply be aware of that and they must then ex expeditiously refer that woman on to a practitioner who does not hold the same opinion as them, so that the, the woman is not delayed in any way from getting services. This is another um, infographic which is up across the, the stuff that I've already talked to. And of course the thing that stands out about the Northern Territory is that we are the only jurisdiction that doesn't um, legally allow early medical termination of pregnancy up to nine weeks gestation. Um, and so we have the paradoxical position where we have a law from 1974 that is leg um, legislating and regulating current reproductive health practice which is actually out of date. So we're now providing obsolete health care to women and we have done now for several decades and um, I think that we are now in breach of CEDAW in the Northern Territory. So the, the med I'm now referring specifically to the Northern Territory legislation because this is where we're standing today. It is one of the most conservative regions. Um, it states that a termination of pregnancy must occur in a hospital and that is restrictive if you are wanting to provide services in primary health care such as GP offices, family planning offices or remote area clinics. It requires the approval of two doctors, one of whom needs to be um, an obstetrician gynaecologist and it's got a gestation then a limit on it as well. Um, there is almost no other procedure in medical practice where you require two doctors to sign off on something. Um, there's very few. It, sometimes when you certify someone and, and you, um, com, you know, they compel them into seclusion, m medical seclusion because they're mentally unwell, requires two doctors. So if you're incapacitated, if you are, have um, a mental disability, you might need two doctors or a guardianship board. But if, I, I question if you're a grown adult woman with full human rights, I don't understand why two doctors need to um, sign off on this procedure. It is simply um, a technical barrier that does not do anything to assist. Um, the other issue is around very young women uh, under the age of 16, so teenagers. And here we have a law from 1974 stipulating that um, both parents need to consent. I think most health practitioners never want to exclude parents from teenagers' care, but it is sometimes in the best interest that that occurs, and that is very practical, and sadly, uh, sadly for some women, they don't have parents that will support them, or um, have indeed inflicted the abuse on them that makes the teenager pregnant, and why she's actually attending for um, care. And it, our law is still linked to the criminal code, and I think that has, it goes back to that concept of stigma um, that uh, 
influences of how, how we deliver health services in the Northern Territory that is still linked to the criminal code. Now, in the Northern Territory, we've been agitating to reform the law, and indeed we are well into the process of doing that. And this was some of the discourse, the media that um, appeared during that time. So we had socially conservative um, politicians, often men, um, who felt that their personal experience and their personal um, religion should, in fact, play out in legislation. There's been some very uh, widespread um, public advocacy which has garnered significant political attention and uh, has done a lot to move the debate along. So for those of you who are not aware they're in the room, um, there's actually only three hospitals that provide termination of pregnancy in the Northern Territory and both are based or they are only based in uh, Darwin and Alice Springs. So there's literally thousands of kilometres between uh, where a woman might be living and where she can actually get the service. Um, we have very few staff who are able and capable of delivering either early medical abortion or surgical abortion. We have some fly-in, fly-out providers, which makes our service very fragile to staff changes. Um, we have no standalone abortion clinic. We have very few youth clinics or anything that is um, for youth health in the, the Northern Territory. And our sexual and reproductive health education is also extremely scanty and often not culturally appropriate. So the early medical abortion is seen to be one of the ways of overcoming some of these logistical barriers um, that exist. As I said, it was um, developed in the 80s in Europe. It's available almost all over the world, and certainly in the rest of Australia, but not here. There's lots and lots of global literature on the safety and efficacy of this medication. There are many guidelines available. Um, doctors need to do online training processes. There's two different types of medications that a woman needs to take. One of them is called mifepristone, the other is mifepristol. They have a high rate of efficacy and they reduce the need for surgical termination of pregnancy. Um, but it is an onerous system. It's a highly bureaucratic system that the doctors have to go through. They have to actually ring camera to make the authorization. Um, and it's really not clear why these medications are identified for needing that type of authorization. They are no more toxic. In fact, they're not toxic to adults at all. Um, in fact, Panadol is more toxic to adults. And there are 8,000 hospitalizations every year in Australia for Panadol ingestion, um, but not for this. You women are not hospitalized in those sorts of numbers for this medication. And women are asking for it. Women in Australia are aware that this is a technology that they have a right to access. I'm going to finish off, this is the last portion, just around the availability of the data and the research in the Northern Territory. And um, I want to say that when I started investigating this, I was surprised at the lack of data that is available, that's collected or analysed or published in Australia. For a first world country, it is truly extraordinary. Through the accessing the hospital separation data in the Northern Territory, um, I managed to look at over 5,000 cases of termination of pregnancy. And this is um, some very quick, brief kind of stats, if you will, on what's happening here. We know that one in five pregnancies ends in termination of pregnancy, usually only surgical, as I've just said, due to the legislation. Most of the vast majority are occurring in the first trimester, the early part of um, the first three months of pregnancy, and very rarely after that point, and that is probably due to legislation, but also um, to the services that are available here. These 5,500 cases do not include those territory women that left the state to get a termination of pregnancy. We know nothing about those, but we know that those that women do that. Interestingly, 93% of terminations occur in public hospitals, and you can see this like little pie graph. That little tiny piece of pie is the private hospital provision in the Northern Territory. 
And that's very different. In fact, it's the exact opposite to Western Australia. And in fact, almost the opposite to other parts of Australia, where um, it's largely um, done in the private sector at, at really quite exorbitant fees. It's, it's a business. In Australia, it, this, is, this is a business. Um, and you can see that the rates or the percentage of terminations of pregnancy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous women are actually very similar. And that came as a surprise to many people in this data. They, and I'll show you more of that over time as we go on. So these are the 5,500 cases broken down into age grades. And the Indigenous women are in the darker columns, the non-Indigenous in the lighter columns. And you can see, it tells me a couple of things when I look at this graph. And if you take off the older, more mature ladies, and you take off the young girls, what you see is a really almost the same rates for Indigenous and non-Indigenous women. Now, this is not the numbers, because the numbers of Indigenous and non-Indigenous people are different in the Northern Territory, but the rates are remarkably the same. That is interesting. And of course, it starts to get very different down here for the younger girls. And I think that area um, is an area of vulnerability. Uh, it's, it's an indication of cultural differences. Um, it's an indication of access to services. We certainly need to be doing more for young Indigenous girls. And some of these girls were 12 years old, 12 and 13 years of age. This is the same, or no, it's a different data set. This is a data set that goes from 1992 to 2011. So a quite a long period of time. Again, it, the data is disaggregated into Indigenous and non-Indigenous women. Um, the non-Indigenous women are at the top. And you can see that there's actually a slow decline in the rate of termination of pregnancy over that time. That's good. I think that's quite good news. It, I think what it's probably showing is that we're having um, better access to reproductive technology. When women have the means to control their fertility, they usually put it into action. And so things like LARCs, long-acting reversible contraceptives, have become more and more available in Australia. And it's perhaps due to, in part, to that. The little star there is there to remind me to tell you about the inclusion of the private patients' data. Prior to that, private patients were never counted in the Northern Territory. I don't know why. I don't think it's a conspiracy theory. They just no one bothered to count them. So you can see that the trajectory probably would be quite different if private patients, and they are largely non-Indigenous patients, um, were included. The bottom graph chart line, what am I saying? Oh, the bottom broken line shows you Indigenous women. And you can see that the rate claim, uh, going from a low base level up to what I would consider parity. We have a closing of the reproductive health care between Indigenous and non-Indigenous women. I showed that to some Indigenous women in Alice Springs recently and asked them what's happening. And they said, Suzanne, we just got more, we've got more access to services now. We have more access to choices now. And back then, this is missionary times. I think what they mean by missionary times was that health services perhaps were very influenced by missionaries. <laughs> and this is the colonisation of their the, the history of colonisation of the Northern Territory perhaps playing out. I think there's more behind these dots and lines. There, is, there are stories there that need to be told, and that's an area that I would like to research into and find out more what's um, happening for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous women in the Northern Territory. But how do we compare with other places? Now, this data is... Um, in a similar kind of time slot, it's not now. The numbers, if you look at them, are not exactly in um, the right order, as if you will. But this is looking at abortion in developed countries and, and comparing them. So you can see that Australia, which is it's actually sits at about 19 now, um, where Australia sits with similar countries. Um, I think what's interesting, what I want to talk about is these ones, these ones on the bottom. So Holland, for example, is a country that has um, high levels of reproductive autonomy for Dutch <coughs> people. It has um, good access to sexual reproductive health services and education, and abortion is easily available 
and their abortion rate is half of ours. They do that without restricting women's access to abortion. They do it in other ways by having better sex health education and access to services and perhaps a different sort of society to Australia as well, I don't know. This is the teenage birth rate because if you're not looking at abortion, if women aren't having abortions then they're getting pregnant and having babies. So this is, people often ask me, about, so what's the teenage birth rate in the Northern Territory? And um, as always, the Northern Territory always, we always come out on top and the pale blue line at the top shows you the teenage birth rate in the Northern Territory from, it's a decade, uh, in decade. It's gradually reducing. I think that's probably good news. Um, but you can see we are very different to the rest of Australia. And then if we look at the teen birth rate in other countries, again, it, it's not as though um, Holland here on the bottom of the, the lower end of the graph is it's not as though they are having lots and lots of teenage pregnancies because they're not having the abortions. They actually don't have the teenage pregnancies either. So whatever they're doing with their young people, their kids and their teenagers, we need to, we need to follow this and have a look at it. And while you could say Holland is nothing you know, like Indigenous Australia, I think we, they also have migrants, they have migrant communities and they have diversity in Holland. We could, we could still learn from them. And if we put Northern Territory on this scale, which I have done by that light grey arrow, that's kind of where we sit. We're actually behind Bulgaria and the United States. And I think to be behind the United States in this area is really not very good. So what don't we know? We really don't know what the precursors of termination of pregnancy are in the Northern Territory. It's not been published. It's not available. We don't really know about much about the data. The data I could get was really very scanty. It told, it just talks about numbers. And even that you can see, there were flaws in the numbers. The numbers aren't complete. It doesn't tell us a lot about the barriers to care. Um, and we need more investigation into what they might be and how we could improve them. Um, we don't know about the quality of services that are provided in the Northern Territory. And we don't know about the experiences of women who leave the Northern Territory to get some health service. So I would like to do a few things. I'd like to do some uh, geospatial mapping to look at women's access to termination of pregnancy. I'd like to explore women's personal journeys of how they undergo termination of pregnancy. And I'd look at, like to look at perceptions of quality of care for women in Northern Territory, but also for those women who leave as well. And that, this study has actually commenced. I have a PhD student working on this one now. I've also submitted an NHMRC grant, which is why I've put the Menzies logo up there. That's submitted through um, Menzies, and we should hear about that very shortly. So there is um, two studies. One is focused on the Northern Territory, which has begun already. And then I'm looking at a national level at the provision of telehealth across abortion but only looking at those women who are in what I would call regional or remote areas. I'm not going to um, work with the women who are sitting in Melbourne or Sydney. They will be excluded. Um, but just looking at these ones who are in the um, outer areas. And as I said, there's a thousand being done already, and there's a, a number of women who I can make contact with through a telehealth provider to uh, interview them and to survey them. And if the NHMRC comes in, this will uh, cover this kind of research. Um, this is just an example of geospatial mapping, if you haven't seen it before. Um, but this is an example from uh, Canada. And uh, Canada is very similar to Australia in many, many respects. And we'd like to replicate this type of um, study for the Northern Territory and then over, put some different sorts of layers over the top of it. Uh, I think it could uh, show some interesting things and would shift perhaps our policy thinking as well in this area. Another um, method that we probably will be using is patient journey mapping, where individual patients and health, and health providers provide stories to show how um, patients get to services and the complexity of the travels and um, the, the, the passage through the health system that they have to make. 
and um, this is this is work that's already been done in maternal health care, renal dialysis, cardiac care, and I think we can apply it to termination of pregnancy as well. And I think it, it, instead of just collecting, in the, in the past I've seen kind of tragic stories of phenomenological accounts of women's need for abortion, which is very important and relevant, I think it's time to move on and look at this from a health perspective and health systems perspective. So this is the final slide. My key message is, is that top or termination of pregnancy is actually life-saving. It's actually health-preserving and we need to start talking about it in those terms. It's a positive thing for many girls and women. An unwanted pregnancy is not, but a termination of pregnancy is. The Northern Territory data is very limited and patchy and it needs improvement. The Northern Territory um, top clinical care is out of date and this is due to a policy and law inertia that's happening nationally and at the um, territory level. There are definite legal impediments to termination of pregnancy nationally and in the Northern Territory and these need to be removed. Indigenous and non-Indigenous women have very different patterns of termination of pregnancy that need further exploration and study with Indigenous women in partnership. And Australian women's reproductive health and rights could be improved by focusing on access and equity in healthcare. So thank you very much for your attention today.